everyone has a story. The automotive world is surrounded by some of the most passionate people on the planet. There's builders, collectors, and craftsmen who all have something to tell. Brad King, and this is Stories in Steel. Today we visit the home of Matt and Debbie Hay, a prominent couple in the hot rodding world of Pro Street. Matt talks about his beginning in hot rods, his father introducing him to Indianapolis, and how that moment started another chapter in Matt's life. We also discuss how his wife Debbie plays such a huge part in his passion of mechanical madness. This is their story. It's a it's a nice a nice balmy day here in your garage. <laughs> yes, yes, it's a balmy day. Yeah, welcome to my lair. Well, thanks. Uh, this is this is awesome. We're uh, we're, we're hanging out, and it, as a kid, this would have been my dream to be sitting in front, you know, talking to you in front of this car. Obviously, iconic. And, and so, speaking of that, as a kid, what got you into cars, man? Where where did it all start? Whoa. Uh, I figured I'd load the question. Right yeah, uh, that's well. As a kid, like everybody growing up in, in the '60s, you know, there was kid. You know, you had the models and you had the Hot Wheels and you had all kinds of stuff. My uncle, uh, I, as far back as I can remember, uh, was into hot rods, built old hot rods and whatever he could put together. And every once in a while, we go over and see what he had. And and you know, I was probably four or five or six. It was always fun to sit in him, and I always got around that. That was just something that was intriguing to me, you know. And then. Uh, but one thing that's uh, interesting before we get into the car deal is um, when I was young, I was into model trains. Right. We, model we're talking trains. about that. Yeah. And obviously, model boats with model boats, model trains. Cool stuff around here. And uh, ironically enough, my, my brother Mark was into uh, building model cars. He's three or four years older than me, and he was building the cars. And I was watching what he was doing, and he was taking these cars to model car shows and winning trophies and stuff and I was sitting in the basement watching my trains go around you know but uh, so I was in the trains and and he was into the model cars and and it just so happens as we got older I got into cars and he went to work for the railroad crazy so, how that yeah, worked out it's crazy but uh, I would say just kind of just kind of happened I don't know I think probably got into cars when I got my license you know I saw a guy that had a Mustang, he had ladder bars on the bottom. I thought, oh, wow, that's cool. Ladder bars, <laughs> bright yellow. You know, I had to have ladder bars. And from there, it just progressed, you know, too. But now, okay, let's, let's jump ahead just a little bit. So before we get to Mustangs, which is, you know, really where kind of you came up in the whole street machine thing. It was, you know, kind of street freak looking Mustangs and that kind of stuff. And then into, obviously, pro street. But like, okay, influence wise for your first build, what influenced your first car build? I would just say the, the magazines and the movement. There wasn't one car out there or you know, even a couple cars that said, you know, I got to have. I mean, if, if we go back as far as back to the, my, uh, I had a 69 Mustang in high school. And, you know, I remember being able to buy a, a Velocity stack for it, Mickey Thompson valve covers and whatnot. And I built a set of ladder bars in a machine shop in high school, you know, <laughs> save some money. None of it was performance, you know, I just, right. I thought it looked great. Uh, but it was just, it progressed from there. Um, I think there wasn't a car, if- Just was, one, just one in particular. Yeah, so one, it was kind of a whole, more or less just a, a mishmash of whatever appealed to you. Yeah, you know, and-, and That makes sense. I, I mean, grew up in, in the 60s, and then when I got my license, uh, you know, I think in 73, uh, in our hometown, Cruising was huge. Cruising was big. And I used to ride with guys back, you know, when I was 10 or 12, we'd go up town cruising and I would see these cars and stuff. And I always thought, well, I gotta, someday when I get a car and some money, I wanna, I wanna build something to go cruising. And so 
everything, you know, I, I don't know that I went out to copy people. I mean, that's easy to do because what do you do when you throw a set of valve covers on an engine or, or whatnot or a certain, my, you know, I always tried something a little different with the paint job and uh, of course I was the only Ford guy in our town. Everybody had Camaros and Novas, <laughs> Corvettes, you know, so I was that Ford guy. But, uh, yeah, it just, it just kind of progressed. And, and uh, I think what really, I, I built that uh, 69 Mustang and then I, I started building a, a 66 and it was a, you know, a street freak car. And tires were sticking out. And, uh, I remember cruising in that a couple of times, but then in 78, I went to the first Street Machine Nationals. I was able to go to, which I think the second one they actually had, and so this would be the second annual. And I just, things just blew me away, you know, what guys were doing. Because uh, people were coming from all over the country, California and the East Coast, and here we are in Indianapolis, Indiana, at this, you know, Street Machine Nationals. Deal. Said, wow, this stuff is real. You know, this is cool. <laughs> so that's... Uh, that, that was a heavy influence, and, and we talked about this before. One car, I guess I can go back, one car that got me into really doing something different was there was a Duster. Okay. And I always thought Dusters were cool cars, but I, out of the factory, they just, the, the rear end, the rear tires, it seemed like they were just, you know, it was just, there wasn't any tire there for that because they had <laughs> wheel wells. And some guy showed up in a, in a, a Duster that was tugged, and I go, oh my God. If he can make this duster look that bitchin', then you know there's hope for me yet. <laughs> so that's uh, that was a big influence just on that, I think. Right on. So you go from seeing that. Now, did that plant the seed for you? That was the one that made you go. Yeah, it, it, I was hooked. So okay, I was hooked on just any kind of building a car stuff. I don't whether it be the motor, the rear end, the chassis, anything. I just and I just. I was driven just to, I want to do something different. It wasn't never anything like, I want to be better than this guy or a better car. I mean, uh, nothing like that. I just wanted to excel with my own capabilities, you know. Right uh, there's guys, so, so many guys out there, they're so talented, so talented. And you read about them, you see them on TV and whatnot back in the day, and I thought, well, you know, I'll just have to do my best. So that, I, but I wanted to do always do different things, so. Awesome. I'd say you definitely did. And you know, uh, taking that though, like okay, as far back and staying with the Mustang thing and doing your own thing, your red '79 Mustang. Mm -hmm. Really, that was one of the first cars that kind of like warped my brain as far as tubbed out cars. Is that car sat? I mean, flat on the ground. And you were. That was at a time when tub cars really didn't sit low. You know, a lot of the cars right. that were out there sat kind of. You up, know, a little up, bit up. And like our 66, because everybody was still using the stock front suspension or right. they're, you know, close to it, you know. Uh, so that uh, that came about. I, I finally, you know, I bought a, a pro stock chassis from Alston Racing. And they shipped it to me and I built it. Of course, with that, you know, it had to use all different suspension and everything, front and rear. So I was able to make it as low as I wanted to. And that, it came out right the first time. I was really happy. I don't know if everybody thought that, but I was like, wow. Usually I'm sitting like, like this car, you know, lots of different heights and this and that. And I went, okay, it's got, it's got to be perfect. That car, I put it on the ground. It's like, I'm done. You know, I just <laughs> loved, I loved the way it sat. So I remember we had Street Machine Nationals uh, the first year in 83. And um, Rick Dauberton, everybody knows who he is in the industry. I didn't know him at the time. And I remember he came up and he looked at the car and he was t talking to a friend of his, and he says, man, that car is slung. And I thought, he just said that about my car. That's so cool. So the next year, I had my license plate slung. <laughs> yeah, that's what the plate said. Good thing slung. you used that word, right? Yeah. But I didn't use any of the words that people called my first cars. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they let you have those on plates. <laughs> yeah. So that was, uh, the 79 was cool. Yeah, and uh, a small block Chevy in it. Right. Uh, 79 Ford Mustang or small box. So I went there again. I was trying to be a little bit different. Uh, there weren't any 79 Mustangs out there, Fox body cars that were Pro Street that I knew about. Right. I didn't have anything to go off of. I was hoping it would be the only one, and I'm sure there was quite a bit out there. But I, you know, for what I was doing and going Street Machine Nationals, I was still the only one there. And they were talking 5,000 cars. That's crazy. Though. So, and then the Hot Rod Nationals was they'd have that like a week or two before or after the Street Machine Nationals. 
but uh, so we did a small block. It was an LT1 350, and then I had an Ed Pink supercharger. 80, 81. Ed Pink set up a uh, uh, display at Street Machine National, and he had an Ed Pink blower, 671 polish with a little Ed Pink sticker on it. I was like, oh, drooling over this thing, you know. I don't even remember what it was, and it didn't matter. I, you know, I, I got to buy this thing. And I tried buying it from him right then. He said, no, nah, we need it for the display. He said, but afterwards, I'll sell it to you. Well, afterwards, I said, okay. So they, he took it with him, and then later on, he shipped it, shipped it to me. And uh, that's how I ended up with the Ed Pink. It's a great car, though. And, and now you've lost track of that car since it got sold. Yeah, yeah. I sold it to a guy in Florida in 1984. Right after Street Machine Nationals, uh, I mean, he came with his suitcase full of money and a truck and trailer from Florida, and I haven't seen it since. And I've heard all kinds of stories. It's been crashed. It's in a junkyard. It's you know, it's turned into a drag car, and which didn't take much to make it a drag car. It's already a full chassis. But uh, so nobody knows where it's at. I've been trying to find it for probably five years. What? Let's Tarantino this a little bit. Right. We'll take a step back in time. Then let's go back to the '66. And there, there's a great story about that car, I think, that really ties, kind of, or it really makes it for a family kind of story with this, that car. Um, probably best if you tell it. I, obviously, I don't want to guide you through. Remember when you <laughs> did well, this? Yeah. But, you know. Well, after my 69 Mustang I had in high school and whatnot and thought it was a big, bad, you know, hot rod, uh, I came across a 66 Mustang. That that's when I you know I, I had a, I had a small job and that's when I wanted to start I wanted to do something uh, uh, significant with a car and I was driving down the road in our hometown and there was a '66 Mustang in maroon bone stock sitting along the curb I stopped put a note on hey do you want to sell it I want do you want to sell this car and I got a call that night and he said yeah I'll sell it and it was rust free it had Vegas plates or uh, Las, uh, Nevada plates on it and the guy was from Las Vegas. And um, he said, 350 bucks. I said, okay, that's doable. So I bought the car and uh, took it home and just started, you know, there was some body work. There wasn't any rust on it, but there was some dings and dents started doing that. And it had a 289 in it. And uh, a buddy of mine, uh, Larry Hertzler, we pulled the motor out, you know, and I, I continued doing body work and there was a f another friend of ours that had an LT1 Chevy 350 block. And I thought, oh, yeah, this, oh, why not? This is cool. Let's do this. So, again, I'm a Ford guy putting a, you know, a Chevy in there. So I got the uh, LT1, had it built by Competition Engineering uh, in northern Indiana uh, for a blower. Uh, and just, it was just, it was a street freak car. You know, it had... It had a nine-inch rear end in it, but I had put, uh, what were the M50 14s, big old Ooh, tires yeah. in the back. Uh, and they were sticking out probably a couple inches, and, and I wanted to be different. So uh, a friend of mine, uh, Fred Sibley Jr., Fred Sibley, who was a jet car guy, his father right. was, uh, he had cases and cases of VHT gold paint, uh, gold anodizing paint. I thought, what would be cooler than this? So I got out to... I painted the centerline wheels, you know, it's gold. Uh, uh, it was just, it, it was translucent, I guess. It was, it, this has looked really good. And I did that, and I painted a few other uh, gadgets on the car gold, and, and that's what it was. It, that's what the first car was. So I, it was, I painted it uh, maroon, and it had uh, uh, gold center lines on it. It had a blower. I can't remember what blower was on it. At the time, it was an old wine blower I bought it. So that's what got me started. Uh, and uh, from there uh, is when I went to the Street Machine Nationals in 78 with that car. Okay. And I happened to see the duster that was tubbed. And it just, the juices started flowing. I thought, wow, this is, a, this is quite a movement. You know, this is cool. So, and Deb was, of course, with, uh, with me, and as she was every year. I said, you know, on the way home, we got to tub this car. I don't even know if that was called a tub back then. Narrow the rear end. We got to narrow the rear end, and uh, I had no idea what kind of money that would take, or whatever. But that's 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 what's happening. You know, that's just the thing to do. You know, we did the street freak thing. Now this is this is what's going on, and um, 
Jerry Marcourt, who built the motor for us at Competition Engineering, uh, I was down there one day, uh, and I was telling him what I wanted to do, and he goes, well, I've got a narrow rear end out of my Corvette that I drag race that I want to upgrade, and I can sell you that. Tires and wheels and wheelie bars and gears and everything. I mean, just... And I asked him how much, and he gave me a price, and I go, wow, well, that's, that's good, but I, you know, I can't really afford that. Well, I was talking to Deb about it, and what I didn't realize is not too long after that, Deb, without me knowing about it, went down to the bank, got a loan, and bought that rear end for me. So uh, I, I didn't know what to say. So you know, I got the thing home and we got out the uh, saws and the, the hammers and chisels and I tore that Mustang apart and the whole back end came out. And it was really sad because it was a rust-free car. Beginning in 1979, early 79, I think I got it done. and. So you were right in that, kind of that first wave. Right, oh yeah. Of yeah. real pro street cars, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, we were, uh, and, and it, was, it was really cool, it was when the, the magazine article started coming out. Actually, Hot Rod did an article on our 66 back when it was still street freak, with the, without the rear end, without the tub rear end. And I, that was like the first major article. It just blew me away. Hey, but you know, that'll go down about 15 copies and show them everybody. In 79, Popular Hot Riding did a, uh, story on pro street cars and uh, if I remember right I can't there was three cars that they did and uh, I know uh, Scott Sullivan's Nova was one of them right. I think there was a Cougar and then there was uh, our Mustang that's crazy so obviously you make you make inroads with people you start to make these connections and I mean obviously a lot of those turn into friendships over the years too oh sure so now kind of going that way I'm sure you've become friends with people that you had viewed as like maybe heroes in the industry over time, things of that nature. So let's let's take that and go. You you have quite a connection. Speaking of industry heroes, with Carol Shelby. Yes. Yeah. Let's uh, if we really want to make this time. I mean, that's that's an amazing thing. And you your your connection with him, it is mind boggling to me. I mean, I'm sure it's going to be to anyone watching this. Yeah. How did you become connected with Carol Shelby? Uh, by chance to start with. But like anybody else, you know, going back in the 60s, Carol Shelby was everywhere with his Shelby Mustangs and his Cobras, Daytona Coupes. And, you know, you just, you just, he was everywhere. Magazines and, you know, and of course a Ford guy and me being a Ford guy, this was, it was, you know, he was this an icon to me. I guess you'd say a hero, you know, for what he did. And uh, so a good friend of mine uh, had asked me to go over to Huntington Beach. Uh, Carol Shelby was having an, an auction over there to uh, raise money for his heart fund. That, you know, uh, he had a heart transplant and he wanted to give back, so he would raise money to give to the, uh, and I think a lot of that was a children's deal, you know. Right. And, uh, so we go over there, and I went over there with like, uh, I think I had $400 in my pocket. And the guy, the guy flew me over there, and uh, you know we'll we'll meet up over in uh, uh, Huntington Beach, I think a hotel or something. So the next day we went to the auction, and we're walking around, and there's all kinds of cool stuff. There's this, there's you know a Shelby auction. I mean, I mean everything from trophies to old race cars to whatever. And I'm walking along, and I see this car that looks like it went through a storm. You know, fire and everything. it was just ugly, but I knew exactly what it was. And the fellow that was with me, his name was Dave. And I go, Dave, do you know what this car is? Goes, I know. He says it's ugly. I said, you ever have Hot Wheels when you're growing up? And I don't know. He said, Yeah, I don't know. I don't remember those either. <laughs> and I said, This is the Shelby Turbine that Hot Wheels came out with. Well, the Shelby Turbine was a real car, and Shelby uh, built two of these cars, and uh, they didn't do so well qualifying in 68. They were for 1968. There was two cars. Uh, the one I was looking at was driven by Bruce McLaren. The other one was uh, Denny Hillam. Those were his drivers. Well, they ended up not making the race because there's a lot of different stories. The cars were illegal. The drivers didn't want to run them. They were too fast, too unsafe. You know, there was just a million things. Oh, yeah, this car was there. And he goes, this is the car we need to be, buy. Because he was a car collector himself. He was a car collector. In fact, he had a Cobra, a real Cobra. 
and a couple of Shelby's. And um, he goes, what do you think it's worth? I says, whatever anybody's gonna pay for it. It could be sky's the limit, or we might get it for a steal, but it's worth a lot of money. And he goes, okay. So they, they roll it up onto the, the auction stage, you know, we're all sitting around, and he's just shaking his head. He goes, are you sure? I said, trust me, trust me on this. So the bidding starts, you know, five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars and and he goes, How much higher you wanna go? I says, Quite a bit, you know. So it got up to a point where people started dropping out and he goes, Well, how are we gonna pay for this? I said, Well you buy it and I'll pay, I'll be, pay half of it. You know, I'll I'll come up with the second half of the cash when we get back to Arizona. And uh, he said, Okay. So it got up to a pretty decent price. Uh, a lot cheaper than I thought I'd go for. And we bought the car. Well, he knew he was good friends with Carol Shelby. So really, Dave introduced me to him um, okay. right after. He says, this is Matt. He just bought your car. Though. And uh, we, we got to talking. And I was just like, you know, probably drooling out of my mouth and made a fool of myself. But it was just, you know, surreal to be talking with uh, Carol Shelby and buying one of only two cars that were built by him. So uh, that's the initial meeting. And then throughout that day, we did some photo ops and publicity stuff for some magazines with Carol Shelby because that was all part of the auction, the promotion for the Hart Fund. Very cool. Man. Who, who did this and that? And that's how I got to know him. Well, he said, Matt, he said, you know, you know, anything you need from me, just give me a call. And he gave me his card. He said, just ask for me. He gave me his little business card. I go, wow. I said, well, I'm going to be calling you because I'm going to restore this car. And I'm going to, he goes, well, all right. I don't know if I remember much, but that's what I want to do. So, so you took it home. You put a small block in it. <laughs> small block with a blower. Okay. <laughs> that same Ed Pink suit. And anyhow, we, it, we got it home. And the first thing I did was we put it on a trailer. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Tom Walsh, was really into race cars as well. And we took it on a trailer up to Phoenix to a sandblaster. And we told the guy, he said, when you sandblast this thing, take it down layer by layer and take photos. And he did, because it had a paint job on it, because it was in a few futuristic movies over in Hollywood. They used it for a backdrop for some crazy movies, because the car looked was a weird car. And they painted it up uh, green and black and orange and stuff. And it sat at Universal Studios outside when they were done with it for years and years. Jeez. Just sat there dilapidating. And then Carol got it back for the auction. So I said, take it down layer by layer. So as he did, he took photos, and we finally got down to where the original crew chief, Ron Butler, driver, uh, Bruce McLaren, I mean, it was just crazy stuff. So then I said, well, let's take it down all the way, and then we, we wanted to paint it back originally. Uh, the guy who repainted the car in its original form, uh, style, was Squeech, the same guy painted this. This is crazy how everything's starting to overlap. Yeah. This is okay. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and getting back to Squeege, as the original, or as the, the second painter, the original pay, painter was Chip Foose's father. And uh, so it's just, it's, it's an all neat little tie. Got the car back, started assembling it from paint. I didn't have, it took a, a turbine T58 uh, General Electric motor. And uh, so I got a hold of uh, Art Arfons in, in Ohio. Oh yeah, we got lots of those things, what do you want? I said, well, can you build me one up? And, uh, he, you know, he built one up, made a real pretty show motor out of it, you know, and <laughs> sent it to me. Well, we started doing shows and whatnot, and I would call Carol Shelby, and I'd say, uh, I have a question about, you know, whatever it might be. I, uh, how is this thing? At, he goes, Matt, you know, he says, I don't know. He says, you probably more than I knew, know more than I do, you know, because I was reading all these <laughs> books about this, turbo, what was out there on it. One of the most... Uh, awesome experiences I ever had with him is Carol and I and a good friend of ours drove up to Santa Fe, New Mexico for dinner. Let's go to dinner in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Oh, okay. So this entire trip, I'm riding with Carol Shelby and I said maybe two words. He was just, he, he just was so heartfelt in his entire story. I mean, it was like our own personal little deal there, you know, just listening that's... all the way up there. And I sat across from him at dinner and I was still like, and, that, and that's why I had a chance to ask some questions and whatnot. And then, uh, but it was just an amazing experience, you know, and, and we became, you know, pretty good friends. And I, we stayed in touch uh, quite a few years after that. So 
you have the turbine car, mm-hmm. you're showing it around. What eventually becomes of that car? Uh, I had a gentleman that was interested in it big time. He, he collected some of the stranger automobiles that were built out there, and the turbine car was definitely different. And he, uh, he wanted to buy it for a year or two. And finally we came up with a price, but his, the, uh, the scoop, the deal was, is he had a Lamborghini Countach. Now, talk about childhood dream cars, you know. Everybody had one of those. Between, just gets better. Right beside the Farrah Fawcett poster, you had a Lamborghini right. Countach poster. You know, if you didn't have those, you know, I don't know what you had. But you were a strange kid. You were a strange kid. So, yeah, Lamborghini Countach. And he said, I'd like to offer that as partial payment for the, for the uh, turbine car. And I told my son. And, of course, he's, again, he's 9, 10, or 12 in there or somewhere like that. And he's just drooling. Oh, really? We're going to get it? And I said, well, I want to think about it. But anyhow, it was, it was time. We, you know, I would like to hold on to the car at the time. But we thought, well, you know, going to get a Countach out of the deal and some cash. I mean, you got to go for it. Right. So we ended up making the trade. And I got this really, really cool, uh, it was a pearl white. Uh, it was with a blue interior. And there's, I think, if I remember right, there's only four built. It was the uh, LP400 car, uh, back before mm-hmm. injectors and stuff, and back before the big rubber bumper. I mean, it was the, the, the cool epitome one, right. and it had the wing in the back. So, I, oh, this is great. So we had a blast driving that all over the place. You know, that was, that's what happened to the turbine car. Is it turned into a uh, uh, Lamborghini and a wheelbarrow full of cash. You know, so one thing was fun though. In between there somewhere, uh, I was unemployed. When I stood at the Lamborghini, I was unemployed right before I started my business. So I started drawing unemployment checks. And the greatest thing was driving the Lamborghini to the bank to cash my unemployment check. <laughs> I had people, <laughs> they look at this, look at that. I said, yeah, man, I don't have a job. You know, so I had to you know, make it or break it, and that's when I started my business, the IndyCar business. And that's a big part of your life, too, the IndyCar business. Yes. yes. This is, uh, wow, you, you have amassed quite the, uh, the collection of, <laughs> yeah. of IndyCar parts. I was always in IndyCars going back. Yeah, I was, you know, my dad got my brother and I into IndyCars back in, the, in, in, for me, it was 64. He took me to my first Indy 500. And, uh, you know, from there, it was always IndyCars. Just love toys, models, and everything, uh, and whatever. You know, once a year we got to see the delay, uh, the delayed broadcast of the Indy 500 because you couldn't watch it live back then. You had to wait, wait for it, and it was on a little black and white TV. So, but it was still once a year I got to see Indy cars. That's really cool. So that's how I got started in that, and uh, I just I had an opportunity. Oh, man, I'm bad with dates, but after uh, when I started my Indy car business and whatnot, there was a uh, Allen's or Juniors, 1987 March IndyCar was for sale in the in the paper. It was in Scottsdale, and I, oh man, and the price seemed right. I need an Indy car to sit in the garage, you know. I need one of those. And Who doesn't? Plus, I was thinking of promotion stuff. There's a lot, you know. You can do a lot, you know. You can you can sell the use yeah. of an Indy car big time, and that's what that was my first car I bought. I was able to rent the car out here and make a few bucks there, and eventually. Uh, I was back in Indiana, in Indianapolis, at a charity auction that was selling Indian racing memorabilia, shirts and suits and car parts, and used wings, crash parts. And there was Raynard's the chassis, an IndyCar chassis. I was at this auction and they were auctioning off some brand new carbon fiber IndyCar parts that were out of date. And I bought a few and I bet these are cool. And I, I, there was a lady there, uh, Melissa, that had a Raynard shirt on. I went up and I said, you with us? She says, yeah, I represent the company today. And I says, do you have any more of this stuff? She goes, we got a warehouse. I mean, it was the North American distributor for Raynard. And we got a whole warehouse and we got tons of obsolete stuff. So I said, you mind if I come and look? And I came back to Arizona in the meantime and I sent her a wish list of some things I wanted. She goes, so yeah, we can sell you some stuff, but my boss doesn't want you to come in here and cherry pick. You know, we don't have time for that. So I can understand that. So I went back there and 
I, and I picked up a, a brand new nose and wing, and I'm thinking it's, you know, part of the business and, and some of the guys that went wall art. And, you know, I wasn't thinking that this stuff was going to be reused for vintage racing or anything like that. Mine was the wall art and the memorabilia. They can decorate an Applebee's, right? Right, yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, with IndyCar stuff. <laughs> it was all carbon, and none of it was paint. It was just all brand new. And that stuff is very, very expensive. That was high dollar stuff. And she said, oh yeah, I can send you this stuff, but uh, my boss says no more of that stuff. We want to sell the entire lot. I go, well, that's not gonna happen. You know, we want to sell this entire inventory. And it was worth big money. I mean, big, big, big money. And uh, an entire inventory. And they called me back the next day. Melissa did and said, Matt, I've got a deal for you. Boss says, if you give us a check by tomorrow morning, you can have it for X amount of dollars. And it was just a fraction, a fraction of what it was worth. She said, everything's here except for a tub, one of the chassis at NASA. NASA's using it on display right now uh, because they're showing how composite materials are used in racing and the space program. So, but that'll, that's part of the deal too, the entire chassis. And those chassis were, I think the bare chassis without anything is $160,000. She goes, that's part of the deal. All right, it's a done deal. So I went to the bank. I went to the bank. I got a check out that day. You know, I think I got rid of a bunch of stocks, whatever, it just and put it into something I can control. You know, you can't control stocks. Not right. me. I'm not smart enough to control stocks. I always lost. So I put it into any car business, and I bought this entire inventory. And that's what started. And then after that, a lot of race teams that were progressing to the next season or the next uh, chassis style or whatever, they were calling me. Said, hey, we got an entire warehouse full of stuff. Well, it got to the point where I was scrambling to get money, you know, uh, to pay for these things. But I was doing my best to buy every everything every every time a race team called me and said, "We got cars, we got inventory." You know, I was all Jeez. over the place, from Detroit to California to, of course, Indianapolis, uh, buying buying race cars and parts. And that's what how the business started out. And I, I have a massive warehouse. So. <laughs> you know? So you're selling these to people who do vintage racing now, obviously, because yeah. these are you're buying obsolescence. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, they're obsolete. But uh, what's neat about this is, you know, guys, some of these cars. I think the I had older cars. You know, I had cars from the '60s, of course, the '68 uh, Shelby Turbine, but the these Reynards and Lolas, Lola chassis. I started buying once the Lolas became available in 2006. Uh, the oldest one I'd get like 1990. Four, and then on up and a lot of the parts you thought well you know not that many people are out there running these cars there was there's different programs uh, American IndyCar series there's vintage racing and it's funny you know a car like the Lola over here isn't you wouldn't consider vintage but if you know right. if, as long as it's an obsolete vehicle you can run it in some of these vintage races you know you can run it at Indy crazy. at Fontana uh, so which started out as a memorabilia thing. Started, so I started selling cars. You guys want to race these things, and they were putting motors, whatever motor they wanted into them. It was, that was the beauty of it. Whatever they could afford, you know, they could they could buy do a motor package for twenty grand, or they could do a motor package for over a hundred thousand, depending on what motor and electronics you want in it. So they started buying these things up, and I sold quite a bit of those. And then they, a lot of the cars started going to uh, uh, for display. There's a guy in Canada that's got one hanging on the wall that he bought from me, you know. Uh, there's some at some of the uh, go-kart tracks around the country, the indoor go-kart tracks. Right. For themes. But even even uh, at, uh, today, I was, uh, it was, it's a huge business, and I, I've been fortunate because there's only a few of us in the country that do this. But even today, I was uh, packing up uh, half shafts and constant velocity uh, joints and they're shipping them to uh, Germany. I got a customer over in Germany. Who buys. It's all the mechanical stuff. Bodies and wings, they're kind of dated. Uh, wings go to a lot of guys that put them on uh, uh, drift cars and stuff. Okay. Uh, bitching to have a, you know, an Indy car wing on your drift car rather I than some little classic thing you bought from <laughs> J.C. Whitney. But anyhow, so, but mechanical stuff, brakes, pedals, uh, steering shafts, gears, gearboxes, uh, anything that goes into an indie car. I sell all over the world to anybody. I mean, I had a guy from, uh, I think he's from Belgium. He called me and says, hey, will this, this brake package fit on a BMW, something, something, I said, I have no idea if it will. 
I said, if you got any talent, you can make it fit, you know. But I said, I can't guarantee that. And he ended up buying it. I never heard back from him. But now on the great side, let's talk complete cars. We'll take a, another weird step back in time. Uh, complete car, which had, you had the 64 Mario Andretti rookie car. Mm-hmm. That's see, that, another cool thing you've owned. There's, yeah. You've owned all kinds of cool stuff. But Yeah. I mean, you know, a lot of guys had uh, Michael Jordan's rookie card. I had right. Mario Andretti's rookie <laughs> car. And uh, I bought a bunch of memorabilia stuff, too. I bought, you know, Mario's racing suit from back then and helmets and tires and wheels. And I had that for quite a while. And we did the same thing with that. We took it to shows and used it for promotion and whatnot. So let, let's, let's, since we're bouncing around time here. Sure. Why the heck not? Let's, let's tie this all into the garage we're sitting in. You built an Oldsmobile in this garage. Yes. At the height of what I would say kind of when Pro Street was really coming up to a peak. Yes. It was climbing that peak and you built that uh, particular white Oldsmobile. Right. Again, so uh, uh, going back to I never wanted to do anything, you know, somebody else did. Uh, I always wanted to be different. So I thought, let's start with a front wheel drive family cruiser, you know, a grocery getter. So I can't quite remember why I picked the olds. I think I saw a photo of one in a magazine or something, a car and driver or something. And I thought, there's a good candidate because it's either going to be turn out crazy cool or it's going to be just a huge mistake. So Deb and I drove up to, um, it was Edward Oldsmobile in Phoenix at the time. And they had a few in stock. And I went, I told the salesman, he come running out. Well, yeah, yeah. I said, I said, listen, I'm looking for a bone stock, old Sierra. I, no frills, no, nothing. I said, well, we got these white ones over here. And I think they're like 10,500 bucks for a brand new car in, in 84. That's the one I want. Test drive? Nope. You want to do it? Nope. I said, I don't want any, you know, I don't want any extended warranties. I don't want anything. I should have gone for that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, as the story goes, I do take it back to him um, after it was done. Hey, this doesn't work. But, uh, so I got that thing, and Deb and I, you're driving at home, I said, this is a nice car. I mean, it was a nice plush interior, and it's driving, so before I cut it up, we drove it for two weeks. Went to get groceries in it, I think we went out two to weeks. eat a couple times, you know, and I backed it in the garage, and it's front wheel drive, so everything was, the motor and everything, I just, first thing I did was uh, jacked up the front end to probably about, you know, five feet high undid all the bolts and just dropped the motor and all the drivetrain right out. Boom. I got with hold of Alston. Uh, they graciously sent me a uh, Pro Stock chassis with strut suspension. You know, it was a state-of-the-art chassis at the time. Do a small old Chevy, super sharp. Let's run it on alcohol. You know, ethanol, alcohol, whatever. I said, I don't know anything about that stuff at all. And I said, but what can we do for transmission? And a friend of mine at the time uh, knew a, a drag racer that had a Lenko out of a funny car. It was a three-speed. So then we started selling this to the manufacturers we wanted involved with that. You know, the rear-end guys, the tire guys, Mickey Thompson, uh, the blower people, of course, Alston, anybody that had parts. They were still, you know, kind of like the old, old Sierra, you know, front-wheel drive deal. And, and I could be wrong, but to my knowledge, that was one of the first front-wheel drive cars that were was made yeah, into was. a, a rear-wheel drive, uh, obviously a pro street car. I started putting this whole thing together right in this garage here, and uh, I took a lot of photos of when we were assembling it. Deb was out here. She was doing everything from helping me hold up, you know, parts to the rear end, you know, to get it measured in, jack and tack welding, and uh, we I painted it. So we were out here. She was block sanding it with me, and we were just doing everything we could, just the two of us do, you know, uh, to to build this car. It was, it was always just been Deb and I building these deals with some, you know, some help from here and there. We had some people volunteering to come over and pitch in that were just wanting to be part of the build. We did that and got the car running on alcohol because I didn't know anything about it at the time, you know, and I, I knew that alcohol was a, a tricky deal. Uh, but the coolest thing was is out here in Phoenix, uh, you know, 100, 115 degrees, I could run that car all day. It could sit and idle. It was just idle and not get warm. And you know, two three minutes into the into the run, there'd be frost on top of the uh, 
the injectors. It would be frost. It's 110 outside, and there's frost right. on top of the injector because the alcohol. And I literally one time I was a big candy bar freak back in the day. And I had a candy bar in my truck melting. It was a Hershey bar. I laid it on top of that injector hat. You know, within a minute, it's frozen solid. Hey, this is perfect. You know, a second use for this car. So, but. Getting back to the, the whole deal, we built the car, and now we're like, okay, we're gonna take it to the uh, 19, it was uh, 84, it's getting to 80, it was an 84 we bought it, in 85 it was finished, and we're taking the street machine nationals, and we had no idea what kind of response we're gonna get, you know? And we, and it just, it bl literally blew people away, you know? A lot of like, there's so many cool builders out there that built pro street cars when they first car. came out with the car. I mean, we could go on and on about all these guys, and they all know who they are, uh, they're great people, and they always had that first debut car, and everybody went crazy over it. I wanted to have that same experience with that Olds, and it did. It just blew people away. Uh, Lanco, you know, small block Chevy, you know, and blowing. And they didn't realize it was on alcohol until we fired the thing up. And people were always looking underneath the back of it, how low it was, because they wanted to see the tubs. And, the wheel right. and I had a rearview mirror, of course, and every time I saw somebody do that, I blipped the throttle. Oh, <laughs> you know, alcohol fumes. And a friend of mine who was with us, uh, I think he had a shot or a video of somebody, you know, just, ah, you know, they were just, <laughs> eyes were burning and just, just going nuts, you know, and that was cool. And then of course, when we shut it off, you didn't, ha you didn't I didn't shut it off with the ignition, you shut it off by, you know, killing the, the fuel, so it'd lean out. So it just, it had the same sound as like a top fuel or a funny car. You'd rev up, you know, and then drop off. And that, that was a big plus, everybody just, you know. That is. See, and now that paved the way to yes. the Thunderbird, yes. Which is another car that got put together. Right here. In this garage. Right. <laughs> and on a quick note, it was built in this garage as well as the, uh, the Oldsmobile was. And jumping forward really quick, we restored it in this garage. Which is funny. I mean, so this is second go round. Yeah. Right. In yeah. The same, this is amazing. Yeah. So, it, you know, the same. Same garage, same people. Deb was out here. We had very little time to get it done. Uh, the second go around, so she was out here thrashing with me, you know, most every night. But getting into this car, I was building, started building new cars every two years, and sometimes they'd overlap, you know. And I would primarily sell the car, the previous car, because you needed money to build another one. But the olds I wouldn't have had to sell. You know, I, I thought about keeping it, but it's still, that was the back of the time. I didn't, I didn't think about keeping cars or anything like that. You just, okay, you're done with it. Something you built, you got, yeah, right. done. It was done. a tool, you know, it was, it was just, you're done, you know. It was, so we, we sold it and uh, I got in a Thunderbird. Uh, when Ford came out with the Ford Temple, which was kind of looked like a Thunderbird, but what got me excited, it wasn't, you know, it was short and pudgy looking. But what got me excited was Kenny Bernstein was running a tempo funny car, stretch nose and zoomies. So I had a guy draw me up. He, uh, he worked for me, uh, and I, he was, you know, he was an artist. He could draw some stuff. So he drew me up a nice pencil, uh, color and graphics and stuff. And I went to see him, and I called uh, Jerry Green, which was head of SVO at Ford back in the day. And I said, Jerry, you know, we've been talking a while. I think I got something that uh, you might be interested in. He said, Well, let's let's talk at SEMA. So we're we'll have we got a, a little show or a office set up, you know, a little place where we can get together and, and chat. And I never forget. I was walking. I was so proud of this drawing of this temple. A couple of angles and I, angles. I said it's going to have zoomies. It's going to be like Bernstein's car. I'll stretch the front end. It's going to be cool. I said it's going to be. Neat. And he looked at it. and He goes. He showed it to you know one of his other principals. Put it on there. He goes, no. He says, no. No. You know. He goes, how about a Ford Thunderbird? And I said, well, that's cool, but from what I hear, you're going to discontinue the Ford, this, the you know the, 70, the 87, 88 Thunderbirds because this was 1987 at the time, and they're going to go to that turbo coupe or whatever it was called, a, a different version. He says, no, but we want to promote the heck out of these, these last builds or these last run of these cars. He says, and plus, we like Thunderbirds. We'd like to do that. And so I looked at it. I said, well, okay, you know. Okay, that's good. Let's do that, you know. So I, same kind of idea, but I thought, all right, let's run with that. So it was maybe a month, month and a half after SEMA, they 
a big old truck shows up at the dock. We're working. Open the door. Inside this, you know, big semi-truck trailer was a brand new Turbo Coupe Thunderbird. All black with the red tri stripes and whatnot. And, you know, I had to get in there. We had to drag it out with a forklift. And look, I said, oh my gosh, you know, this is cool. I called Jerry. Hey, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. We'll see it see him in next year. So uh, we had... We had uh, less, of a, less than a year to take it from a, a new car to what you see here. Yes. And um, so, again, I said, okay, what are we going to be doing? This is, this is 87, 88. Uh, the paint, uh, we wanted to come up with something really different. Miami Vice was big. And I'm thinking, you know, kind of a you know, pearl pink, you know, pastel looking deal. Uh, and, you know, again, I said, what are, you know, pink car? No, nothing was really done pink cars before. Uh, it was Pro Street, obviously, and so I said, okay, we're gonna, let's do Pro Street, uh, pink car, Thunderbird, I got this all going in my head, and I, th I had the vision, okay, we're gonna do this thing. So after I put the, and of course, Alston uh, sent me in the state of the art Pro Stock chassis. Outstanding. Yeah, I had to build the chassis, but I wasn't arguing, you know, I, I built all the chassis. So they sent that, and by then, people were climbing on board. People were actually, you know, uh, we were very fortunate. We were to the point where manufacturers were calling us and saying, we got these new set of wheels on this car who happened to be uh, what you see on these here, center lines. And Mickey Thompson says, well, no, we still got the, uh, the big Thompson, you know, we went on that. Uh, Curry Enterprises, they were, they were coming out with all kinds of pro street stuff because that was the thing, you know. So they were doing a lot of narrowing. So we got a lot, of, a lot of help from manufacturers. And after I got the chassis in the car to where it, would, it was a roller, and I, I, the motor was kind of in my head of what I wanted to do, but I, I just had to take a break. I wanted to get the chassis done roll. I wanted to get the paint shop because uh, painters take forever. Sorry, Squeege. Do good work. <laughs> Anyhow, so he, uh, him and his dad, uh, Doug Jerger, and then his dad, Squeege Squeege, uh, they came up with some neat, they came up with five or six graphics. I said, I want the top half of this thing, it's got to be pearl faded pink. I said, and, and, and I said, what, you, you guys can come up with the bottom half. So they came up with five or six renderings, and this is the one we picked. Deb and I, I remember Deb and I went over there at lunch hour one time and looked at this, and I said, that's it. I said, okay, we'll get started. So while they're doing that, I got this idea in my head. I said, you know, remember the old dragsters from the 60s that had the pot bin blowers in the front of the front of the hemi or the small block where they had the blower the 671 or whatever they had on in front and I said I always thought those things were really cool but what kind of application would that be because it's going to stick so far out it'd be sticking through the grill or the nose of the bird right. so I said well I'm going to do that but I'm going to uh, change it up a bit so I got a hold of B&M blowers and I said they were just came out with these smaller blowers C377s or whatever they're called and they're, you know, maybe a foot long. I said, well, I don't want just one. I gotta have two, let's run two. So, and I'm gonna reverse the direction so I can have the front of the blower, the drive section facing the engine so it can be driven off the crank. And uh, Jim Davis at B&M at the time said, oh, okay, this is great. We'll do this, we're on board. And he says, what are you doing for transmission? I said, I haven't got that for you. He says, we got a new C6 package out right now. Uh, we'll send you a new C6. And he sent it to me, and the thing is fully polished. I mean, it's show quality polished. And I called him, I said, Jim, this is so nice, but you're never going to see this thing. You know, this is on a car that's like two inches off the ground, and in the tunnel. He said, well, we wanted it nice. So anyhow, he sent that over. So that's how we got that, uh, uh, the blowers and that. So then I came up and I thought, how am I going to mount these things uh, to the engine and, then not, and not run out of room hitting the radiator or whatever. Yeah. So I spent probably a good week, I built wooden bucks. I built all these wooden, in fact, I still have one of the, the main wooden bucks that I built. Uh, and, and of course, after that, we turned it in, made them aluminum, built aluminum and whatnot. But, and I mocked all this stuff up with just empty cases and crude bolts and I, that's it, okay? But I still only have this much room between the blower, oh. you know, and the, and the, the nose uh, where it comes. I, I, I'm, I like indie cars. I've been, you know, I dilly dallied around those, but I'm going to do two, two radiators. Two radiators. I split them. And that was perfect. 
So now they, you know, the nose of the blowers go through where the radiator was, it split the blower, the radiators up. So that's what we did, and that's how we came to that. I slant, had to slant them back a little bit so they fit under the hood. Right. And that's the, the, how the whole motor concept came to be. And that, and incidentally, seeing how we got the car from Ford, it's the first car I built with a Ford motor in it, uh, ex excluding the, the days of the Mustangs way back right. in high school. So uh, it was a 351. Windsor block and how I uh, got that is Alan Root. I hooked up with him at SEMA and he had just come out with a package for Windsor blocks that uh, was all aluminum heads. He says, I'll build your motor with these aluminum heads and send it to you. Sounds good to Thanks. me. Yeah. So that's how we got, came up with the Ford. And then I built the plenum on top and the tubes that you know feed from the blowers into the plenum. So we squeeze paints the car pink, get the car back, uh, I think in late March, and we had to uh, mid June to get it done. And then again, we had uh, even though we did well with the Oldsmobile and whatnot, I still has like, is anybody gonna like this car? You know, it's gonna pull out of the trailer. It's pink. It's got this scoop on it. You think there's gonna be Dominator carburetors underneath of it, and you're gonna pull off this hood, and people are gonna go, what is that? You know, I just had this, you know, the old builder's fear of uh, being accepted right and again we were very fortunate we pulled it out of the trailer and it was it was an instant hit yeah, so it became a scale model yes you know, yeah Ravel liked it so much they wanted to build models of the cars and I knew uh, the guy at, at Ravel because previously he had done Rick Doberton's J2000 right and I had been in contact with him and he was like well let me know when you put your car down but that was a that was a big thrill to have the the model and, and they did really well they sold hundreds of thousands of kids uh, right like that. so that was kind of a neat deal and then it came back around again in a super bowl commercial yeah you like it's <laughs> yeah yeah of all things well when we got the car back we sold the car in 92 uh and i could go on and on about that we got the car back or sold the car in 1992 and then uh it went through three different owners. Uh, didn't fare well. Uh, it's a little worse for wear. Yeah, it had some wear on it. Put um, away wet. Yeah. Deb, I remember everybody's. What are you gonna do? What are you gonna? I said, well, I'd like to buy the T-Bird back, or let's build a new car. Should I build another car? She goes, you better. You better build another car. And that was a spark I needed. So all the way home, you know, we flew in for that deal. As so we're flying back, I said, it might be cooler to buy the T-Bird back and restore. It should be a lot cheaper. <laughs> ah, wrong, famous last words. <laughs> yeah, wrong. <laughs> there again, there's another house for you. So we we deal with this guy that owns the T-Bird. He was gracious enough to give me the time to talk to him and, and then end up selling it. And we had to drive to Pennsylvania to get the cars in Pennsylvania. It was in his living room in, in uh, Pennsylvania. Why wouldn't it be? Well, why, I mean, that's where I keep all my cars. So we drug it into the car, got it home, and so it began started restoration on it and we had nine months to get it done and the only reason people are out there saying well why do you have to have it done in nine months because me from the old promotion days and uh, building up the excitement for the car I committed to have this car at the Street Machine Nationals in 2014 of course and that was you know that's kind of the rebirth of that whole movement right right which is the rebirth of that right after the reunion so I had nine months to get it done and we just thrashed, pulled the motor out, and, you know, rebuild the motor. The car went back to Squeech. The original guy painted this, you know, in 88, painted it again in 2014. They did their, they, they worked their magic on it. In the meantime, I'm rebuilding the motor, rebuilding the transmission. I'm going through the blowers. I'm trying to do as much as I could for what was here. And then I got it back from paint, I believe it was uh, June 4th, and we had to have the car and to coin on the 17th or 18th. And I still need all the interior put in, all the lights put in, the wheel, the rear, you know, everything. Because uh, when I got it back from Squeege, I took the rear end out because I still had to go through that because it needed to roll when it was there, obviously. Put the motor in and everything. So it was a, and Deb was out here just, you know, it was warm, June. Just we're just sweating, we're just thrashing away, uh, getting it done. And we got it done and we took it back. And what was interesting about that is because Ravel did a model of it back in, uh, 92 or whatever it was, 91, 90. I called Ravel up. He said, Matt, 
I said, well, he said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm calling, can I talk to, uh, you know, legal or something? I'd just like to use a Ravel name because our contract ran out with them years ago. We, you know, we had a royalty contract with them. And he says, well, yeah, but I, I can do you one better. We are actually at this time considering reissuing your kit. I said, you gotta be kidding me. After 25 years, you're over here, I'm over here. We just happened to merge together on a phone call. I bought the car back and you're doing, I mean, that's divine something. Right. You know? huh? But that was such perfect timing. And That's uh, so beautiful. they reissued the kit. And then, it, and then we got the, uh, became members of the Television Motion Picture Car Club, which is a club out of Southern California. So I, I remember a couple years ago, uh, Phil Fiore, who's a member of the uh, movie club, and he owns a, a business called Next Pictures, which supplies uh, props and primarily cars to the okay. industry. Um, and he, he knows everybody in that. He calls me up and said, Matt, he said, uh, I got a gig for you that you want to come over. It's a television commercial. Or he said, he says, it's a TV, it's a shoot. I got a shoot for you. I go, okay. I said, was well, this for a print ad or video or what? He says, no, 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 it's, it's going to be for a commercial. I said, okay, that's cool. He said, what, we, what do you need? He said, well, you got to come over to Ontario Airport because that's where they film a lot of stuff. You'd be surprised what's filmed at Ontario Airport. Anywhere from Mission Impossible to... Uh, I don't just uh, all kinds of movies, you know, yeah. just kind of crazy stuff. It, you, I could go on and on and on. Uh, Seal Team, the TV series, a lot of that's filmed there at the airport. So we get over there, and uh, I meet him in the morning, and we he, he takes us over to the airport. We pull in there, and uh, there's other a few other custom cars around and stuff, and there's this big jet out on the tarmac and. He says, we, we, see all where all those movie trailers and film and camera guys and lights and stuff are? We need to just drive the car out there. It's probably a good eighth mile, quarter mile away. And we get out there and pull over, and right away they put it on one of those uh, trailer gantry, you know, deals that they tow you around on. And, and uh, they have a gentleman get in the car that I had no idea who it was. And he was, they were setting up cameras on the trailer and on the car and whatnot. And... Um, I said, who's this? He says, well, that's a stand-in for Chance the Rapper. And I go, Chance the Rapper? He goes, yeah, he's a big-time rapper guy. You know, he's, you know, he's pretty big, and he's an upcoming guy. He says, he's going to be the one driving your car in, in this commercial. I said, by the way, what is this commercial? And he says, it's going to be a Super Bowl commercial. And I looked at Deb, and I go, <laughs> I said, we got to get this right. <laughs> we got to get this right. You know, come on, car, don't fail me now. Like the Blues Brothers. Right. Don't fail me now. <laughs> So he, you know, I'm fitting this guy in the car. So they got the cameras and stuff. And, and then we pan over to the right, or we just kind of looked right, and we're sitting on these, you know, director type chairs, or the Backstreet Boys. So this, is, this is a huge production. So what are we doing here? You know, I thought we were just going to drive the car in a commercial. Sure, right. So now it's a Super Bowl commercial for Doritos. So that is how that got to be there was uh, we were allowed, we had to turn in our phones and we weren't allowed to take any photos you know any of that stuff however um, a gentleman did snap a few photos and which I've you know shown some people uh, of the shoot I would like to have a lot more because we were really I mean all day long I think it was a 13 or 16 hour shoot down to like a minute commercial you know yeah. and uh, but there were some pretty cool times, you know, with Chance the Rapper and the Backstreet Boys that I would have loved to just have photos of and stuff. But, uh, but yeah, we did our thing. You know, they, 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 they had Chance driving up and down on this, this trailer deal, and that's where you see him in the commercial singing to one of his, to, uh, his, the, his Doritos type song and whatever. And then you see the Backstreet Boys uh, singing their I Want It That Way tune. And then when you see the car on the airport, a runway driving, I think it opens up that way. That's me in the car, dressed as Chance the Rapper. The, the Chance's uh, wardrobe. Is there a uh, spitting image? Yeah, oh, yeah, you know. yeah. Uh, she put the hat on, the T-shirt on and everything. She says, just sink a little lower. And then the director, this is a great thing. It took about five or six takes for that one shot of me driving down the road. And I don't know why. To me, they all look the same, but I don't have a movie eye. And uh, they kept saying, he says, and the director at the very end goes, Matt, he said, oh, this is on the intercom. He says, Matt, he says, you got to act more like Chance, like you're rapping to a song when you're singing, like you see him in the car. You got to be doing that. You got to be bopping your head around. And I want you to say these words and these words and these words. And they were just all, <laughs> you know, nasty rap words, you know. And 
If you don't make that a hashtag for yourself on social media, just say nasty rap words. Yeah. This is going to be perfect. He's got a new nickname today. Yep. So the very last take of this thing, he gets on. Matt, you got to nod your head and start singing these songs. And I said, okay. So you can't really see it in there, but I'm doing this and I'm saying all these nasty words, you know, and going on and act like I was singing this rap song. And I noticed the intercom, the, <laughs> the walkie-talkies on, and it goes out to all all the production. And I thought. Why am I even saying this? I can mouth the words. You know, it's about halfway through the drive. You know, somewhere off there, somebody's got that, and they're just waiting. It's going to be a TikTok video someplace oh, online. Yeah. It's going to be great. Yeah, if I ever run for president, <laughs> they're going to use that against me. I don't know. Flaming hot nacho Doritos, and that was when they—that was—they were just out. Right. They just came out, and uh, so it was a big deal to be involved with that. And Chance and the Backstreet Boys and the wife. You know, it was just a great experience for all of us. That was that. So you went from a hot rod top ten to the snack food aisle. To the snack food uh, aisle, the, yeah. Orange fingers and the tongues. Dorito, the Doritos car, which the is Doritos funny, car. So. Yeah, it used to be Matt and Debbie Hayes, Pro <laughs> Street Thunderbird, you know, and now yeah, I get the people car. on the internet. I mean, literally from all over the world, it's the Doritos car. It's the Doritos car. Uh, I get from Japan and I don't know where, uh, UK, Australia. There's guys in Australia. And there's uh, all the time. The Doritos car. It's the Doritos car. I saw the Doritos car in a commercial because they ran that commercial not only during the Super Bowl. It went well, on after, for and it went. months and months and months, and it was on all kinds of networks all across the world. Tens yeah. of millions of views now on YouTube. And Seven, like yeah, so 17, million on, 17 million views on YouTube. So what's next? Uh, just kind of, <laughs> I don't know. Good, good question. I would like to, I don't think I'll ever find the 79 Mustang again, so I'd like to build another one of those, and it'd be a simple build. The, the IndyCar business is kind of keeping me busy right now, but awesome. I, you know, I've sold a lot of the cars. I used to have like a dozen in stock, and I'm down to one. <laughs> so good on you. <laughs> yeah, good on me. You know, I just I gotta say that you know, uh, you know, Deb has really been a big part. I mean, a lot of guys, uh, you know, they have supporting wives. Uh, most everybody does, but you know, I was fortunate enough that Deb, whether she wanted to it times or not, she really got involved, you know, to support me and the whole Pro Street movement. And she got to know a lot of the magazine people as well, and it was just a lot of fun, you know, all that. But she she did everything uh, that uh, I asked her to do, or she'd come out and say, hey, I'm going to tackle this tonight, or I'm going to do this tomorrow, or whatever. So she, all through all the cars, she was always there getting things done and, and helping me get it ready, and that last second push, you know, of course she drives the rig. When I can't drive anymore, I sleep in the. Tr she's driving the rig down the road, you know, at the trailer, and just, you know, it's all, but she's always supported me 100, percent you know. So that's one thing I've always liked about you guys. It was never in a magazine. It was never Matt Hay. It was always Matt and Debbie Hayes. Insert car here. Yeah. And that was that was awesome. It was cool. That started, I think, uh, shortly after the first Pro Street car we built. I remember one article, in fact, it might be that popular hot riding one I was talking about earlier. It said Matt Hay. But after that, for some reason, I mean, I think that the editors and the publishers and stuff started seeing that we were always kind of a team. A cool deal. I was like, I remember, uh, and not to date anything, but I was in maybe eighth grade, ninth grade. And uh, one of the things I decided to write a paper on was Pro Street cars. Uh. And I remember writing yours, and everybody else was, was the one name, one name, and yours. I remember to this day typing that, and I was like, Matt and Debbie Hayes. And I was like, I want to meet these people someday. And now it's it's kind of funny that, like, in this small hot rod world, you, you're a guy you can go out and get a burger with. Yeah, oh, yeah. That's funny. Uh, this is really strange. So for me, I'm not the fanboy of this, but it's just oh, a neat thing. As long as you're buying the burger, I'm not. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, well, well, you keep bringing bags thing. of chips, so. We've all, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody need any Doritos? We got uh, a bunch of them. That was fun. Outstanding. It's a great full life, man. You've, uh... Yeah, thank you. It's been fun. Uh, a lot of interesting, you get to know a lot of interesting people like yourself, Brad. You know, you just, it's, it's, it turns out to be a tight knit family kind of thing, you know? It's just like anything else. You, once you get into that circle, you know, it's, you become friends with a lot of people. And it's been great. And it, you know, I gotta really be honest too. Having friends in high places, uh, whether it be you know, on the West Coast, East Coast, or you know, even in the production end of things, it's that's a neat deal to have. 
but what really is the coolest thing is meeting the people and doing stuff and you know going to lunch with you guys and doing stuff and we go back to street machine nationals and we we like to know uh, meet everybody and, and get to know the people who make this all happen really i mean without that there's nothing else right uh, so uh the, the, where our friendship and bonds are really with just the people who are the, for the love of the sport <laughs> I'm Brad King, and this is Stories in Steel. I'm Marlon Perkins, and this is Wild I'm Batman. I'm Huell Hauser, and this is California. I'm the infamous Skeeter Davis. Damn you, Skeeter. <laughs> I'm Brad King, and you're not. I'm Carson Lev from Pink Fin Productions. <laughs> I can't even do that with a straight face. I'm God, and this should be a Hot Wheel. For more stories and podcasts, go to www.round6pod.com.